Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. Ah, <sighs> so I annoyed a lot of people. Way back in August, I responded to a ridiculous Twitter thread by Netflix that tried to portray the Matrix as a trans allegory, with a supporting statement by the co-creator, Lily Wachowski. I showed that this thread was nonsense, uh, reaching, and wishful thinking. And, uh... Oh boy. I don't even see the comments anymore. All I see is subjectivity, irrelevance, shrieks of transphobia. So I made my first video really quickly and there was a lot going on in the comments and I thought, okay, I've got to do a fuller version of this topic. And then my PC broke, which was fun. So this is later than I intended, but I do want to give a fuller look at the topic of the matrix as a trans allegory. And I'm going to be arguing as concisely as I can why the Matrix isn't a trans allegory. And then I'm going to tell you which of the Wachowski films actually is a trans allegory. They did make one, it's just not the Matrix. You'll see. However, I also want to be clear from the outset that this is not going to be an ownage video. I am not going to be arguing either that the Wachowskis shouldn't make a trans film. I'm actually going to argue that they did. And I want to be really clear that I'm not going to be using any cheap, ignorant, transphobic jokes to make my points. Uh, this is a classy channel and all the transphobia is going to be sophisticated, refined and advanced. You're welcome. So I guess the best place to start is probably going to be... Now I'm sure we can probably all think of a couple of film allegories, there's maybe one popping to your mind right now. The, certainly the ones that come up for me would be, say, Fright Night, which is about a gay teen overcoming his internalised homophobia. Or it might be the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which was an allegory for communist subversion in America. It could be Mother, which is an allegory for the early biblical stories. It may be the classic and yet still timely allegory for the Soviet Union that is an animal farm, or maybe you're thinking of Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards and its scene demonstrating that King Kong works as an allegory for slavery in America. And while those examples are helpful, I still think I should probably go with the definition to work from. The Oxford English Dictionary comes up with this definition, which I think is a very good start, but isn't exactly perfect, although I do really appreciate the etymology it throws in. While it is pretty darn accurate, this dictionary definition is not quite there and is actually missing something completely crucial to the meaning of allegory, and that is the word coherent. It should be, in my view, a story that can be coherently interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. Yeah, you're not the only ones who can get annoyed at dictionary definitions. I, I think having the dictionary as a background here makes it look kind of more authoritative, don't you think? If I used this, I, I don't know, I just kind of feel I'd ruin the effect. So the first kind of counter argument to my video that I want to address is the idea that people personally view the Matrix as a trans allegory. It is for them personally, subjectively, a coherent trans allegory. If you're going to argue that the Matrix is a trans allegory because it has that meaning for you personally, uh, good for you, but to be honest, that is kind of a sneaky and unhelpful argument. It's not helpful for two reasons. One, because if it's just an entirely subjective meaning, uh, then anything can be an allegory for anything without needing to justify. Now, obviously, multiple readings of things exist, and that's kind of the fun of interpretation, but the the problem is you invite a kind of reductio ad absurdum situation where anything can literally mean anything. It can mean the thesis, it can mean the antithesis, and it can mean the synthesis, all in one. To try and be more clear what my problem with this is, if anything can be an allegory for anything else, it is kind of ludicrous to celebrate one particular allegory above any other. You can be picking out the Matrix as a trans allegory because you personally see it that way and you want to celebrate that, but then it would be equally valid to say that it is a gender critical allegory, which I'm sure Netflix UK would not be rushing to celebrate. And the other major problem with this is that 
because it is relying on your personal experience, your personal associations, it's not really the matrix that is the allegory, it is the matrix plus the special source that you are bringing and slathering all over it. And therefore for anyone else, the allegory isn't there because they don't have your associations or experience. This is not helpful because it does not make the reading coherent. So that is why I'm writing off the personal subjective allegory argument. It does not make The Matrix a trans film and it does not make the Wachowskis point. Now the second argument I want to address is the Word of God argument. That, that was very common. I'd say it was probably the second most common argument after just calling me a And the Word of God argument is essentially that The Matrix is a trans allegory purely because the directors said it was. Now they said this two decades after the fact, after they had made The Matrix, after both of them had transitioned. Hmm. Now as a side note, I find this really interesting because it runs very counter to a lot of the conversation in the LGBT sphere at the moment, where people present homoerotic subtext to justify a queer reading of something, whether or not the author may have intended that reading or whether they directly objected to it. For context of that, uh, in July 2021 when I'm recording this, this is a hot issue in the Lord of the Rings community. As with environmentalism, deindustrialization, or national sovereignty, people continue to insist on thematic readings of Lord of the Rings in direct contradiction to J.R.R. Tolkien's statements that there was no subtext to Lord of the Rings. He pretty much said the ring was the ring. Much fun has been had with the upcoming Tolkien conference after the passing of Christopher Tolkien that now, uh, effectively in direct contradiction to his and his father's wishes, that there will now be intense postmodern intersectional queer readings of Lord of the Rings. Now that might seem like a tangent, but I do find it funny that we are hearing both that the author's intention is all that matters, and also that the author's intention doesn't matter. Basically, whatever justifies that queer reading, right? A lot of this attempt at allegory I really feel is wishful thinking from people who love a certain story or film and want to love it even more by making it a bit more relevant to them personally. That's, that's the nicest way of saying that I think it's wishful thinking or wishful overthinking, if you will. And I also want to be fair to the Wachowskis here because Lily's statement in the video that is included in the Netflix thread is basically quite ambiguous, and I'm just trying to be fair here. Lily Wachowski says both. I'm glad that people are talking about the movies, um, the Matrix movies uh, with a trans narrative. And. But it was all coming from a closeted point of view. And. I, I don't know how present my transness was in the, the back, in, the, in the background of my brain as we were writing it but it, it all came so, from the same sort of fire that... So to be fair to Leila Wachowski, I think you could honestly say that Netflix essentially overhyped this. Leila Wachowski does say that there is a trans narrative, which is a lot vaguer than allegory, and I think it's a lot easier to support that. There are certainly elements in The Matrix that lend themselves quite easily to that interpretation. However, I think we can still dismiss Lily Wachowski's much belated statement for the same reasons as before. That is, it is not laying out a coherent allegory. And that is the chief problem. I don't think there is a coherent trans allegory or analogy for The Matrix. And in the interest of balance, I think it is also possible to support a slightly more cynical reading that it is not inconceivable that she is making that statement now to fit current needs, current culture, the sort of trans-obsessed social climate, and also to sort of foster the siblings' reputations as trailblazers after a run of critical and commercial failures after the issue of trans, uh, transgender things became very personal. So I'm gonna go off on a bit of a tangent here and I hope you'll indulge me because I don't know when else I'm ever gonna talk about the Wachowskis as innovators and they did something really cool that I want to draw a bit of attention to. 
On the Matrix Ultimate Edition DVD, in the commentary section, there is no director's commentary and we can all speculate why. Instead, their plan was to have four guest commentaries, two positive and two negative. That is, they were going to pay for commentaries critical of the film on the official merchandise. I think that's pretty darn baller. Now, I don't know what actually happened, what happened in the planning of the making of these DVDs. Ultimately, only two of those commentaries were recorded and put on, but uh, there was still one positive and one negative. I want to see more of this. I think it shows so much confidence in the film and it really adds to the conversation around it. So to round off the word of God argument, hopefully you've already picked up that it's effectively just a slightly more authoritative sounding version of the first argument, the argument from personal meaning. It's just been subcontracted out to someone higher up. So that is a subjective arguments dealt with and we can just chuck them out. To cut to it, the best way to argue that the matrix is a trans allegory is to argue that it is a trans allegory. That is, you're gonna actually have to lay it out, show what the symbolism is, show the meaning, lay out an actual narrative consistently throughout the whole film. Now, the argument's still gonna fail really quickly, but you know, at least it'll be substantive. Now the individual bits of imagery that the Netflix thread is made up of might convince you by the number of them, but there is no coherent vision here. When people do actually try and lay that allegory out, there is, there is a surprising amount of variation in how they approach it. And that's kind of interesting. I don't tend to see them argue with each other over how the allegory should be laid out, uh, just with my disagreement that a trans allegory applies to the matrix. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of like people just really, really want this to be a trans film. And as long as it has got that label, as long as it's classed that way on Wikipedia, they're happy. But still, people making this argument, they, they are doing the right thing. They're actually attempting a reading of the matrix as a trans allegory and highlighting the symbolism. That is the way to do it. So to give an example and show you how sort of superficially convincing it can be and how many items there are that you can pick up on to make the allegory, I'll give you an example. So the society, the matrix is a fake reality. It is artificial, it is constructed. And from birth, it gives you this false identity that you didn't consent to, but it forces it on you. Now, while it works for most people, a few people in the society feel that something is wrong. They just know it's wrong and they end up rejecting that society and the identity that it assigned them. They cast off this illusion and wake up and they effectively transition into a new body, a new reality and their real selves. Now it's tougher after this transition, but it is at least authentic and they get to be their real selves. As a result of this rebellion against society though, these outsiders have to fight being hunted, persecuted, and for some of them, it's so hard that they end up returning to the matrix and trying to forget about what they know. That is one reading and it's probably quite convincing to a fair few of you. But the trouble is it's not complete and it's not coherent. So you're left asking questions like, here is gender artificially created by outsiders or is it a natural concept that a tiny minority have an issue with? In this reading, both being put in the matrix and being taken out of it are artificial processes. And then you have the really big problem, which is residual self-image. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. That is, you explicitly look like you think you look in the matrix, explicitly your own internal perception of yourself is accurately portrayed in the matrix. This is the death blow to the reading and it would be the easiest fix. All you'd have to do is have people look radically different in the real world. I'd be much happier with that. But the Wachowskis didn't do this and their only consideration of this 
was the precise opposite. So we had the character of Switch, who was like a character who would be, you know, a man in the real world, or and then a woman in the Matrix, and you know, that's both were <laughs> where our head spaces were. And that is implying that you transition into the Matrix, the fake world, not into the real world, the exact opposite of the standard allegory. And a final problem for this standard reading of the Matrix as a trans allegory is that in this reading, the crew of the Nebuchadnezzar are regularly having to go back into the Matrix, and in the Matrix are essentially superheroes, you know, which for the allegory is implying because of their trans status, they're getting to cheat to get resources, they get unearned powers and privileges, they get to attack regular people and be seen as heroes, and ignore the literal laws of science to get their way. <sighs> Disavow. Yeah, so you see the problem. It, it's not that there isn't material for the allegory, it's simply that there is no coherent reading. And, and that is why I disagree with The Matrix being the Wachowskis trans film. There are just bits that can be read a certain way if you really want to, and a flawed attempt to make a narrative that falls apart after a couple of basic questions, and uh, even some statements from the creators. No trans allegory here. I mean, I don't want to make this video too long, but if you want something more coherent, there is a very obvious allegory and that is an allegory for intersectional social justice activism. Um, I could spell it out, but by now you know how to make an allegory, so give it a go. What do you think this means? Why is Neo in particular the one who has ultimate power within the system to change it the way it needs to be changed? Give it a thought. Now I said multiple times in comments and also at the start of this video that I do believe the Wachowskis did actually make a film with a trans allegory, but it's just not The Matrix. So to that end, I present V for Vendetta, which the Wachowskis wrote and produced and thereby had a huge influence on. And while Lana Wachowski didn't actually publicly confirm her transition until 2008, her trans-adjacent activities were being talked about in 2003. I'm afraid I had zero luck finding it when I went to research, but I do remember that there was a rather unpleasantly invasive piece of journalism looking into the Wachowskis' personal lives around then. This charted their use of sex workers, their involvement in the kink scene, uh, you know, that might have influenced The Matrix somehow. I, um, I can't put my finger on it though. Now the rumour mill had started rumbling about Lana's transness in 2003, and in 2004 the Wachowskis start work on V for Vendetta. That helps the idea that trans issues were on their minds. Uh, to be fair though, while the Wachowskis may have been thinking about transitioning on some level at that time, this also happened in 2005. Hi, I'm Andy Wachowski. And I'm Larry Wachowski. Or rather, these are the digital projections of our mental selves. Awkward. Let's summarise this as we can't know for certain about their identities while they made the Matrix films, but there is plenty of evidence against them identifying as trans at the time. It's actually far more likely that they had that realisation later, in around 2004, say. So with that said, how is V for Vendetta from 2005 a trans allegory? Our protagonist is Evie. Evie is in a strictly traditional and quite repressive society with very strict roles that is very intolerant of deviance. Homosexuality is a big no-no, they even get experimented on. Evie is not comfortable in this society and while she takes actions to appear to conform, Internally, she is not feeling it, something feels wrong. Evie then meets someone who speaks out about the false cultural conformity and who wants freedom from it. Evie struggles intensely with ideas she gets from this meeting, but eventually she integrates them and discards the classical symbols of femininity that have been forced on her, most importantly losing her long hair to be effectively reborn 
And most importantly of all for the allegory, there is this scene and this speech. I don't even know what you really look like. If you please. There is a face beneath this mask, but it's not me. I'm no more that face than I am the muscles beneath it or the bones beneath them. I understand. Now this speech explicitly is saying that the physical reality is not who someone is, but it's their internal ideas that matter. Their gender is a spirit or internal sense of self. Their body is irrelevant to it. This is V for Vendetta, written by the Wachowskis three years before Lana's transition was common knowledge. And it's including a statement that works perfectly both for the straightforward story of V as a principled ideologue and as a trans allegory. Now, regardless of how you feel about it, that is a coherent allegory. You're welcome. That's quite enough of that, thank you very much. So, do you reckon anyone who originally called me a f or a transphobic white stuck around for that bit at the end? What do you reckon? Nah. I'm sure that's going to be entirely uncontroversial and attract no abusive comments whatsoever. But uh, that's pretty much all I've got to say on the issue. I'm going to be back to my regular Tuesday live streams and I hope you drop by. Thanks, y'all. Cheese. Oh, it's real on a show. Yeah.